Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Steve DeMello. I'm Director of Healthcare here at Citrus. Welcome to the Research Exchange. I'd also like to welcome our web viewers today. Thank you particularly to the UC Berkeley attendees for your pre-registration. It really helps us with the lunch setup and with the logistics for the day. And uh, one other note before our speaker is that the Eye for Energy talk this Friday is in uh, room 250 of Sitar Jedi. It's on sustaining a green campus by Lisa McNeely, who's UC Berkeley campus's first director of sustainability. Um, it's my great pleasure today to introduce Michael Muneer, who's the chief information officer at the UC Davis Medical Center. Um, and he's a national leader in healthcare information technology with an extensive record of leading transformations of large complex organizations in the use of medical IT. Mike is responsible for developing and executing a technology strategy that supports the healthcare system's four missions of clinical care, research, education, and community engagement. Um, Mike has worked in the healthcare industry for over 34 years. He's held the positions of Senior Vice President and CIO at the University of Maryland Health System, Vice President and CIO at Park Nicolette Health Services in Minneapolis, CIO of the University of Minnesota Hospital and Clinic, and Vice President of Medicus Systems. While at Medicus, he co-designed and managed the development of the first commercial executive information system for healthcare, um, the Discovery EIS. Um, so please join me in welcoming Michael Muneer. Can you hear me? Thank you. As, um, as just shared, I'm the CIO at the University of uh, California Davis Health System. I also have taught uh, at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health <clears throat> since 2001. And I just hit a milestone where I've taught over 500 grad students from 18 countries. So I enjoy that a lot. What I'm going to talk about today is a few slides of context. So why should we care about healthcare and uh, bringing digital technology to the industry? A current status of health IT, and then talk about uh, two of many drivers we could talk about of innovation and change in health IT, which is the secondary use of EHR content and population data, and then our, our push to create a more modern standard around phenotype data to link with genotype data. And then I have some um, 10 areas of, of ideas for research and innovation that you might be interested in. Just to set some context, if you look at the health expenditure per capita in this country, uh, compared to other countries, we're on the far right in America, and um, much higher, as you note, from other countries, so the cost of our care is much higher. Unfortunately, the quality of our care, the quality of the outcomes, is often much lower. This uh, cost really impacts people in this country. Uh, the bottom set of rows uh, uh, but, uh, of lines indicate uh, workers' earnings in America and overall inflation, which tracks fairly well. And then the top two lines are um, health insurance premiums and workers' contributions to premiums. So the gap, even since 2000, uh, between the cost of health care and the rise in wages and inflation is, is very dramatic, uh, very scary for uh, our economy going forward. Uh, further, the impact to people, the cost of health care is so high that the leading cause of personal bankruptcy in the United States is unpaid medical bills. And the death rate of any given year for someone without health insurance is 25% higher than someone with insurance. That seems pretty striking. And so a lot of what we're trying to do is bring efficiencies to health care uh, to get more um, uh, quality outcomes for the investment we, we save and hopefully um, do this for lower money so it doesn't have such, such a negative impact on, uh, on the people of this country and our economy. I thought it was interesting, uh, right after World War II in 1946, there was a catalyst funding program by the federal government in American health care. It was called the Hill Burton Act. And um, it doesn't seem a lot of money now, but I, this is old dollars, uh, not current dollars. About $4.6 in health, federal Hill Burton grants um, and, and $1.5 billion in loans were given to the um, healthcare industry. And uh, basically, since the Depression and World War II, the, the physical plant of hospitals had, had really deteriorated. 
And so this money was, was used to build the hospitals of America over again. In return for these federal funds, the facilities, uh, hospitals, agreed to provide free or reduced charge medical services to persons unable to pay and then make ser services available to all people. If you fast forward to 2009 in the era legislation, part of the uh, 788, uh, uh, $787 billion era legislation was the High Tech Act, which brought uh, $22 billion to healthcare IT. And much like Hill Burton, uh, we're investing in America's healthcare, but rather than building bricks and mortar buildings, we're building uh, infrastructure such as networks and clinical software. And in return for these federal funds, hospitals and providers agree to acquire certified EHR technology. Uh, this is only in the last three or four years that you could get a certified EHR, meaning that it does certain um, functionality, it has certain levels of security, and has the ability to exchange data with other EHRs. Um, we also, as health providers, have to agree to, co to create a complete clinical record. So for example, uh, you might be amazed at how many clinical records did not in the past have a patient's problem list or a patient's uh, current medications. So there's a lot of list of data that have to be included in a patient's record during uh, an encounter. Um, and so a lot of that is now uh, essentially a federal regulation. And also to uh, create a number of clinical measures. So um, things like a, a diabetic clinical measure and many others built um, based on national quality forum standards are also required. Uh, and, and again, in years past, you would not have seen that clinical data in an EHR. And if you wanted to get um, a sense of what was the population's clinical measures, you know, diabetic rates or uh, whatever, uh, you would have to do the, um, the sad task of doing a paper chart audit which, which took uh, months and months and months and was woefully inaccurate. And then uh, we also have to agree to share EHR content with other providers. That was kind of a weak requirement in the early stages of this program, but now it's ratcheting up quite uh, rapidly. So this uh, $19 billion of, of the 22 is really going to um, hospitals and physicians and, and a few other providers who uh, achieve what I just summarized. And then $2 billion went to a number of other uh, programs, uh, some of which to uh, create health information exchange and, and so on. But at the same time, the private market is investing massive amounts in health IT. It's estimated that $73.1 billion w would be spent this year, um, and that was um, last year. And then um, uh, by 2014, uh, $85 billion a year in health IT. And so one of the questions is all this federal money and all the private money is it going to any good? Uh, will it actually improve our industry? Will we actually get better data to support clinical care and research? This has had a significant impact on California, and this dollar amount will, will start um, in 2010. It did start in 2010. It will continue uh, up to seven, um, and in some cases, a few more years. But the impact on California health care could be over $700 billion, and a big chunk of that has been earned by hospitals and providers. Uh, while this talks about consumer products, I think it's an interesting um, uh, RAND analysis where if you look at the, what they call the diffusion rates of technology, uh, on the left you see electric service, uh, you see in the middle uh, a much longer line of uh, adoption of technology for washing machines, the VCR on the right was adopted almost um, immediately. Uh, what's clear from this is that whatever technology you're looking at, it takes a, it takes a while for, um, uh, you know, to achieve 100% adoption in this country, and every technology will have its own rate of, adop of adoption. If you look at what the federal government is trying to do, uh, Rand would have estimated that by roughly 2002, um, at least in acute care hospitals, a modern EHR was diffused or used at 32%. And so from, from that estimate in 2002, the federal government is trying to push it to 100% by 2014. And so that's a fairly steep line of um, technology absorption. Uh, a lot of people have um, shared frustrations about how slow healthcare is adopting technology, but in reality, um, that's a fairly steep adoption right now, but to be sure, in prior years, the adoption rate was woefully uh, slow. There is some uh, evidence that um, the adoption is uh, speeding up. So one of the hardest parts in, of the healthcare industry to automate is physicians' offices. So these might be one or two physicians, 20 or 30 physicians. 
It, it's not a hospital. It's not a big clinic. And as you see back in 2001, only 18.2% of American uh, physicians' offices had any kind of an ER, EHR system, electronic health record system. And if you look at 2009-2010, um, when the era legislation funding started, it's, it's a pretty dramatic increase, uh, up to an estimated 71.8% uh, in December of 2012. So that's impressive, but the, but the sad truth is that the green line shows that a basic system, meaning it's not very well deployed, it's not deeply deployed, is still uh, the predominant use of EHRs in, in that, in that um, 71%. So it's one thing to deploy the technology, it's quite another to use it in a sophisticated way, uh, which is part of where the federal regulations are pushing us. There's really dramatic changes in health IT. Uh, I think, uh, in my opinion, it really started back in the uh, late 1990s where we saw the National Institute of Medicine have a number of reports to Air as Human where they, um, they noted that, you know, hospitals and healthcare kills more people from medical error than we might see on the total of uh, car accident deaths in the country. A lot of um, uh, efforts, a lot of groups came out of that um, notification of, uh, of errors and, and the damage it causes people. So the LeapFrog group has been pushing adoption of technology and, and safe practices, the Institute for Safe Medication Practices and, and Joint Commission and so on. Uh, we've also seen uh, in the last 10 or so years um, a major push on quality improvement. Uh, the Institute for Health um, Integration, IHI, out of Boston, uh, has done a lot of things. They had um, a major campaign to reduce uh, patient deaths and, and patient uh, uh, errors. Uh, a lot of uh, federal effort now is, is focused on comparative effectiveness. If you give a healthcare treatment, is it really working? Is it better than other options? Uh, you probably read, um, unfortunately, today or in the last week about privacy and security breaches in healthcare. So as we become more automated, we, we have had a lot of uh, people in healthcare not really secure the information. We, we've joined a, a whole new effort to certify our electronic health records, as I touched on earlier, where before this effort, which is not perfect to be sure, but before you bought clinical software and it was really um, buyer beware, where now if you buy a certified software system, <clears throat> much like you might see a UL label on electrical appliance, you have some confidence that it's been tested and it works at some level. Uh, we talked about the massive investment, and there's really been an advance in clinical uh, software. So um, I, I think it's pretty dramatic over the last 10 to 15 years. The software we used to deploy in healthcare, to be frank, really wasn't that good. Um, and I could, I could have a whole other two-hour discussion on why it wasn't very good. It's not perfect by any means, but it certainly have, has got a lot better. And our uh, ability finally to interoperate, uh, literally yesterday at the UC Davis Health System, we turned on an interface formally to be part of a national uh, health information exchange network called New and Exchange. And we shared on the first day eight patient records with the Social Security Administration. Um, I have some uh, younger programmers, of course, most people are younger than I am, but you know, they, they told me, well, you know, the interface went live, we shared eight patient records. And I said, come on, I've been trying to do that for 20 years. I mean, they seem to take it for granted, but we're actually sharing data now at a national level. It's still somewhat small, but we're finally starting to share it. And interestingly, just on the Social Security Administration example, why are we sharing data from Sacramento to the Social Security Administration? Someone has um, applied for a disability claim. And it used to take um, literally two to four months for that to be reviewed and approved, if, if it was approved. Uh, now the Social Security Administration is doing that in roughly 48 hours. So these, uh, the sharing of clinical data can have a huge impact on people. Um, and that, another uh, definition of the new reality we're working under, a lot of informatics issues we used to debate, such as, you know, we really should have a problem list and current medications and a patient record. They're now essentially federal and in some cases state regulations. So my life is very different than it was 20 years ago. Most health organizations are now dependent on technology. In a sense, our clinical organization our clinical organization, um, I don't know why I can't say that, our clinical organization essentially runs on a spinning disk in our data center. We were digital in terms of our clinical record in December of 2010. And, and like us, uh, many hospitals and, and clinics struggle to be uh, as redundant and make those investments to match the dependency we have on this new software and, and technology. Uh, 
Uh, yet UC Davis Health System, we spent over $6 million on security technology in the last four years, and we still have more to go. Uh, I grew up in healthcare, but there are days I feel like I work for the NSA with all of the security technologies we have to do. It's really, truly a different world. Uh, we mentioned the federal government is um, a catalyst to all this with, with, with its investments. And we're really seeing, uh, at least in the clinical research area, a new definition of how to compete around clinical research, where a lot of uh, grantors, uh, the NIH included, they're not really interested in giving um, a faculty or an investigator money to build an infrastructure of databases and EHRs and stuff. They, they feel that you must have that in place in many ca cases, and then the grant leverages infrastructure that's already there. So we have a lot of pressure at, at any large ac academic health system to have a lot of not only clinical technology in place, but link that and also have research technology in place. Um, even the accreditation requirements for uh, medical schools and even the residents that we manage after medical school, we, we give them different teaching uh, organizations or, or opportunities. The accreditation is really dependent on having sophisticated technology. And uh, I'm going to talk later about data curation. Uh, one of the dirty secrets in healthcare is the quality of the data we've collected is frankly not that good. And so if we want to make use of the data and improve clinical care and support research, we have to do a lot better job. One of the big things we, we focus on at UC Davis is secondary use of EHR content. So certainly you first have to have a digital record. Uh, in our case, we started deploying uh, the Epic EHR in 2002. As I said, we went digital in 2010. Uh, UCLA, for example, will, will turn on EPIC in production on March 1st, only uh, several weeks away. So what we've learned is that you really have to do the hard work of deploying some of this modern technology, and only then can you, you know, kind of stand back and say, how could we use the data differently? And I'll share uh, a few examples on how we've done that. And, and in a very exciting way, we're now doing that across University of California together. So if you look at all the clinical care uh, technology we have, uh, over the last 11 years, UC Davis Health System has spent $163 million to do this. Uh, UCLA, UCSF, uh, uh, almost anyone at that size is spending equivalent amounts of money. Uh, but unfortunately, if you look at disease registries, quality management data sets, research data sets, uh, the partnerships we do in research, uh, for example, we have a, a partnership with one of our burn surgeons. She has 26 million in American Burn Association grants, and we run a data coordinating center at Davis for 24 burn centers. So increasingly, a lot of our research is multi-site, and, and the complexity that goes with that, especially when they have different ways to collect data in their clinical silo. Uh, again, another silo for clinical trials, how we share data with the government, and so on. And so one of our goals is to take these lines and make them disappear. And if data is created in any, uh, for any purpose, that it could be reused and support other missions. And, and uh, what AMIA, or the American Medical Informatics Association, had defined some years ago uh, as secondary use of data, basically they said we need to increase transparency of data use, focus on data access and use versus ownership of data, privacy policies for secondary use. Uh, for example, when we share data with Sutter Health to, to care for a patient, Sutter has made it very clear we cannot use that at Davis for research. So there's a whole different question if we share data, can we use it in a secondary way? Uh, increase the awareness of benefits and challenges, and then taxonomies for secondary use. We have a lot of challenges around using modern ontologies and vocabularies, uh, you know, period. But basically, you take the EHR content, and there's other data like clinical images and, 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 and other content that doesn't specifically sit in the EHR. Um, and typically, EHRs have multiple ways they store the data. You do some level of data transformation, uh, and there's all kinds of things you could do, and then you have a secondary use. So, so to show you an example, we took our EPIC EMR, and, and the native um, uh, database is CACHE or M um, or MUMPS, and uh, there's a copy of that data in um, uh, SQL, uh, Oracle SQL in our case, and this is more of a data repository uh, data model. Uh, there's 2.1 million patients that we have in EPIC. We uh, de-identify it, so the transformation in this example is to de-identify the data. We load it to an I2B2 uh, application. This was written at Partners and Harvard in Boston, 
from an, a $20 million NIH grant. And then we have a different user interface to look at the same 2.1 million patients. But in this case, um, we can give it to any investigator, any faculty, and they can um, search for clinical cohorts, in a sense, all they want to. Uh, we have an IRB approval of all this process, but basically an investigator does not have to go and get an IRB approval for every query. And, and what this tool essentially does is find cohorts. Um, if, if they find a cohort that's of interest, they want to do a study, they need the identif identified data, uh, we, we basically save the query and then we can go back and give them the identified data. At that point, they would need um, an IRB approval, which we've done many times. The, the user interface for uh, the cohort discovery tool looks like this, and basically using um, all the clinical data as uh, search, we can apply Boolean logic, and we can pull uh, different parts of the uh, clinical content. We can create a, a, you know, a very simple or very sophisticated um, queries based on, on logic, and then what uh, cohort discovery fundamentally does is give you patient counts. And, and again, some of our clinicians do very intense algorithms or queries to find a cohort. And it could be, you know, I want um, uh, gender, age, I want certain diagnoses, I want patients that took this medication, or I want patients that did not take that medication. And we have a series of faculty champions that if we have a new faculty, um, or we do this a lot for our grad students, uh, new to the tool, we will, instead of having a programmer sit down, we will have a, a faculty member who volunteers to kind of give people an overview. In um, 2009, and we uh, fi finalized this in 2010, we published an article with the University of Washington, UC Davis, and UC uh, San Francisco in our uh, main informatics journal about a federated use of this technology. And what we did was um, we, we basically left the data at these three universities. Um, we used the software that Harvard wrote, again, called Trine. Uh, we actually used it before Harvard in a production mode. That was kind of interesting. And we did some minor data normalization. And basically, we did a query against those three databases. And I think it was something like uh, 30 seconds, we, we defined a cohort. And of course, uh, when we, we had an auditorium like this, and we demonstrated that at UC Davis in February of 2010, somebody raised their hand and said, well, 30 seconds, that's a long time. And I said, come on, you couldn't even do this before. Now 30 seconds is too long. Um, that, was, that was neat. Um, and what we've, what we've built on from that is to do this across the University of California. So we have five campuses with um, patient data. Um, and four of us, uh, after March 1 at UCLA goes live, four of the five use EPIC. Uh, which is one commercial uh, vendor EHR. It doesn't mean that UCLA and UCSF and Davis have exact same definition of EPIC, but it's, it's pretty close. Uh, Irvine uses Eclipsis. And um, what we've done is, uh, even though UCLA uh, is bringing up EPIC, they do have a database that they've created with some legacy data. So we have done a, a cohort discovery query against our five uh, data sets. And again, they, they stay locally at the campus. And uh, we first did it with 8.1 million patients, and as we add UCLA, it's now 11.8. And 11.8 represents about one in every three uh, Californians. And we're, we're able now to find queries against our five campuses. And obviously, if we're competing for a grant or we need volume in terms of a patient with certain condition, we have a much better chance of doing it together. And this is managed through our CTSAs and some other um, PIs that our, um, our vice chancellor of researches on, on our health campuses generally do. Uh, one of the interesting things about California, uh, this is probably not a surprise to you, but on the left, if you look at the top 25 most diverse communities in America, and this is from the 2000 census, these red stars indicate um, uh, central California. So um, around San Francisco, Vallejo, um, Sacramento is, is essentially the most diverse area of America. There was an article in Time Magazine four or five years ago that said Sacramento was the most diverse community in America. And to be sure, we, we um, have 20 languages that our patients speak and we have to supply interpreters for. And, and there's some no, no, notification that maybe up to 40 languages exist in our patient population. So one of the unique things about um, this 11.8 million patients is that this represents some of the most diverse people in the country. 
and certain kinds of research requires different racial or ethnic or other uh, attributes that they're testing a drug on or trying to understand the impact of a genetic um, mutation. And so it makes our data somewhat um, more interesting and valuable. If you go to Mayo, we, we work with Mayo Clinic, their database is 96% Caucasian. If you go to Vanderbilt, uh, we work with them, their database is 40% African American, but none of these databases will probably likely ever be as diverse as ours, which has a, a great value uh, for clinical research. We, we compare that to some uh, commercial activities. So the Cleveland Clinic spun out of a company called Explorus. Um, uh, two years ago, they had the goal to have a database of 12 million people, and uh, it was only 9 million a year ago, and now they claim to have 31 million what they called cared for lives in their database. But if you look at their site and, and talk to them, most of the patients come from community hospitals around the, the country. Uh, plus the Cleveland Clinic, which is obviously not a community hospital. And um, uh, w one of the things that really disturbed us about this is that initially they were going to sell the data they, they used to drug companies for research. Uh, some of that selling of data now is um, specifically illegal under the high-tech version of the HIPAA regulation. Um, many of us have felt it would be wrong to do that. And um, we, we may partner at UC with drug companies, but it's typically where we, our faculty are jointly doing research and trying to, to do something together as opposed to just selling data, which I think is something we would never do anyway at Davis. We're tracking many other uh, efforts. Uh, Kaiser, for example, is very active in something called the HMO Research Network, and they have about 9 to 10 million patients. We're actively looking at joining that now uh, with, with Kaiser locally. And, um, I, so I think the, 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 the message here is that if you want to do certain kinds of clinical research, you have to have large databases. They have to typically be de-identified and have the ability to be re-identified if uh, needed and, and approved for certain kinds of research. And there's kind of a, an arms race now to see who can have a competitive position with these databases, and certain kinds of new research uh, you know, won't be able to be done without it. We've done a second type of secondary use where in addition to the uh, cohort discovery it has talked about, we are building a tethered meta-registry at UC Davis. So in addition to taking the 2.1 million patients from EPIC and reusing it again, in this case it's identified, it's not de-identified, we also load uh, legacy disease registries. Uh, and there's a long story, but a lot of these are um, uh, essentially uh, databases that were designed in the early 80s, and they're still that. <laughs> Uh, some of them literally still run on FoxPro. Uh, many of you in the room are old enough to know what FoxPro is, but trust me, uh, you're lucky you didn't have to use it. It's a database. And so um, we're, we're, we're taking some of the knowledge we learned and experience and kind of replicating that, but for a different purpose. And so we've created um, a tethered meta-registry. The term tethered means it's interfaced and constantly updated by modern EHR, again, the 2.1 million patients. It's a meta-registry, meaning that we load all these disease registries into one data model as opposed to creating a silo database for each one, as we've done for 20 or 30 years. And we've already created a cancer registry. Uh, this is the same data we send to the, to the state cancer registry that goes on to the National Program of Cancer Registries managed by the C CDC and National Cancer Institute. And UC Davis, in the last six months, we just took over uh, a grant where we, we actually manage the, um, the state of California cancer registry, and so we're doing a lot of work in cancer. We've created a burn registry, uh, a registry of all patients who have a CT uh, image, and so we've created a registry of basically of how much radiation dose people got. We actually found a patient who had 99 CTs. Uh, that seems like an awful lot. Um, we have a sepsis registry and a diabetic registry, and we're building some others. And, and what's really interesting now is that we can start to look at the intersection of these registries because it's in the same data model. So what about our cancer patients that got sepsis in the hospital? A lot of times if we would create that data, um, you, you could not integrate it because of these silo da data models and, and approaches. And so this is one of the things we're doing. Other uh, campuses like UCLA that are taking a different approach to kind of reusing the data for clinical analysis and, and quality management. To move on quickly to phenotype and genotype, um, certainly we all have genotype information and uh, it expresses itself in phenotype data. Uh, the genotype data is the constitution of an organism or cell, also refers to the specific 
um, a set of alleles inherited at a locus. I'm not a, um, a geneticist, um, but you know, we're, we're actually hosting with the Beijing Genomics Institute, we're, we're building a very large sequencing lab at UC Davis Health System. We've got four next-gen sequencers running now in a temporary lab, and we'll have 15 or more running probably in six months in a, in a, in a, in a genetic lab we're building. And um, there's, a, there's a massive amount of um, data, and if you look at the next-gen sequencers, it's creating new kinds of data where, where you have to rework a lot of your algorithms and bioinformatics to leverage it. The phenotype is the observable physical and or biochemical characteristics of an expression of a gene and, and the clinical presentation of an individual with a particular genotype. So much of healthcare data, you could say, is phenotype data. At our Davis campus, we have mouse clinics. We, we do a lot of mouse research. We actually, like Jackson Labs, provide um, knockout mice to people around the world. And they do mouse clinics, and basically they, they have genetic um, material or, or genetic sequencing done on the mice, and the mouse clinic basically collects uh, phenotype data, you know, color, uh, uh, behavior attributes, and so on. And um, uh, it's, it's basically the same type of thing. But um, what we're trying to do is link more the genotype and phenotype to, to create some, uh, some breakthroughs, hopefully. Um, a lot of the technology development has driven genetics, certainly, but a lot of technology uh, challenges remain uh, in terms of the measurement of cell and organism level phenotypes. The truth is, in most labs, if they have a genotype data set, they basically define their own phenotype data model in most cases. And so if you want to share data among a lot of that research, again, you've got the silo approach, and you haven't typically have a lot of sophistication in how they define the data. Um, uh, the integration of genotype and phenotype content requires annotation and correlation of genotic, gen, uh, genomic information with a high quality phenotype data. And I think it's fair to say uh, we're, we're still defining what high quality phenotype data would, would look like. Uh, viable electronic health records or uh, uh, systems capable of handling family history and genetic data are required. Um, most EHRs, the way, way they would store family history is simply not adequate for genetic you know, family histories and family trees. Uh, so there's a lot of gaps in terms of what we have now in terms of clinical informatics um, and, and how we can link them and leverage uh, genomic data for um, managing at a personalized level. You know, uh, if we now understand uh, the genetic makeup of a person, when we then go to prescribe a drug, we should know more and more in the future will that drug be effective on that person. Uh, many of the drugs we, we, um, we, we use now literally do nothing for the patient of any value or, all the, or they give them a lot of side effects. So a lot of our interest is to prescribe medications that will actually work on that uh, genome, genome of one, the patient in front of us. Um, so the, the, the NCBI has one tool that I thought was interesting just to show. It's a um, phenotype genotype integrator. So you can find a trait, in this case I search for Alzheimer's disease, and again, uh, when in, in the clinical world, when we talk about Alzheimer's disease, we would want to code it in some way. What's the ICD-9? What's the ICD-10? Is there SNOMED or LOINC definitions of that, to be very precise? But you can go down for Alzheimer's and find traits, which are essentially uh, diseases and genes, um, and then the way they would define a phenotype in this NCBI tool is, is a text summary and then these terms. And again, what I'm looking for are what's the SNOMED code or the LOINC code or the ICD-10 code for this so I can know that I'm very precise. And then when they list you know, this phenotype data as they define it uh, for Alzheimer's, they then have uh, a much richer data, frankly, on the genotype uh, side of that. And uh, it goes on for pages and pages, actually getting down to the, uh, uh, to the letters of, of the genetic sample. So the question is, can we take this clinical infrastructure that we spend a lot of money on in this country, and can that be the phenotype uh, data uh, and link it to the genotype data? One, one effort uh, that has some um, uh, NIH funding is, is Phoenix Toolkit. And what Phoenix has done is they've created domains. So these are kinds of diseases like cancer, uh, diabetes, cardiovascular. These aren't exactly how we would define them in healthcare, but they're close. And so they have, I think, 20 of these domains. 
And it, you can choose one like cardiovascular, and you can go down, again, to some very simple text terms. These are not what I would call encoded or precise terms. And so the question is, where are these vocabularies uh, used to define these terms? Um, there's probably 30 ways you can talk about angina or, or heart pain or heart attack or suspected heart attack. And so these kind of terms are very imprecise. And uh, so the question is, these data elements, can we code them, and are they in the electronic health record? Um, what we're trying to do is basically, from the top, go from um, a modern electronic health record, um, create, uh, and this is not really in existence yet, in my opinion, a refined phenotype data set, which will create a lot of change, will need a lot of change here. From the bottom up, you have the raw sequencing data. You, you, you get to certain levels of summarization and, and visualization of that data. And then where can we match that refined phenotype with likely a, a higher level uh, visualization of that genetic data? Um, this is done in, in some labs, uh, in, in some narrow ways, but for the average patient, it's really not done. And what we think of as the innovation intersection um, again, you, you, you have to come from the EHR refined uh, phenotype data set and, and uh, any number of different options on how the genetic data could be summarized. It really means that we have to go back to clinical documentation that's, you know, a lot of physicians still do, you know, pretty much as they've done um, 20 years ago. Some are doing it in a much more modern way. And then use this documentation that, frankly, we spent a lot of money to create and uh, use it for things like research, clinical trials, and disease registries. Uh, for 20 or 30 years in, in, in American healthcare, we've used this documentation essentially to get paid. And, and it's a sad statement that we really need to put a lot more emphasis not just on getting a bill out the door so, so the hospital can get paid, but also support these other clinical and research goals. Um, we need a lot more sophisticated clinical documentation. We have to uh, eliminate the, the use of text. A lot of EHRs are still uh, mostly text. Use a lot more encoded data elements. Um, and we cannot have gaps. If, if we have a patient that we've documented a clinical encounter on, it has to be completely filled out. Um, we need new approaches to data quality. And then we need to modernize the disease registries, as I've alluded to. Uh, new terms, or at least new to healthcare, is uh, things like biocuration, um, where basically, since we have increasing dependence on this clinical data, how can we make sure it's accurate, it's complete, and, and we have a long way to go? Some of the things that we do to support research, we're taking some of the knowledge that we, we learn in the research world on how to make research data sets very accurate, very precise, very auditable, and then bring that back to the clinical care world. So some opportunities for research and innovation. Um, I think these 10 areas are ripe for uh, research and development. So number one, enhance current clinical software to adequately support phenotype requirements. And then once you uh, have an adequate phenotype data set, create new kinds of linkages between that phenotype-enabled clinical system and genotype content. Uh, second, define data structures for biospecimen repositories linked with genotype and phenotype databases. To give you a sense of the complexity here, if you have bladder cancer and you come to the UC Davis Health System, uh, our physicians will probably take your bladder out, they'll remove the tumors in your bladder, and they literally will start to implant those uh, pieces of those tumors and knock out mice, and they'll grow your tumors in mice, and so a mouse will have a, a, a high degree of similarity to you with your cancer. And um, what they start to do is give those mice uh, chemotherapy and other treatments and to see if it's effective. And so we may put a patient on, on a certain drug and he or she may do uh, well, but a lot of these uh, very um, effective drugs lose their effectiveness. And then uh, essentially the, 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 the oncologists know that because of the, uh, the work done on, on a number of these mock knockout mice, which drug would best work for you? It, it's pretty amazing but the notion of keeping biospecimen, uh, you know, your uh, tumor cells, uh, keeping track that we've put them in certain knockout mice and we're growing your, your tumors in mice and then linking it back to new specimens or new lab tests for that patient, it's really getting quite uh, complex. And to say there's a line between oncology care and research, it really doesn't exist anymore. It's all research and care at the same time. We have to, number three, transform patient-level clinical data into sophisticated population data sets. 
EHRs really do not create population data sets. They create records about one patient and one encounter at a time. Uh, number four, we have to enhance uh, clinical data with advanced evidence-based knowledge. We're starting to do that uh, uh, to treat things like identify sepsis in an inpatient and, and uh, alert people. And then when, when we have identified a patient who is preseptic or has septic, sometimes we have patients admitted to the ER with sepsis. Um, we basically have evidence-based knowledge order sets, and we can quickly execute them. And, and, and um, in our case, we've reduced the incidence of sepsis uh, over 26% in the last six months. It's been fairly dramatic where uh, our chief medical officer would say we, we have not been able to move some of our quality improvement needles for many years, even though we've tried, but now the new evidence-based uh, algorithms and, and clinical digital data, we've been able to do some pretty... Um, pretty dramatic improvements in how we're treating patients. Um, again, I think it's uh, right to have a uh, create and maintain a phenotype standard. There's really no standard for phenotype. Create community research networks and integrate them with the provider uh, EHRs and research support infrastructure. Um, number seven, define new models for disease registries. If you want to study a disease, um, do you really want to wait, um, recruit subjects, and gather data for, for some time before you can start your studies, or do you want to go to uh, the EHR at UC Davis or the EHRs at all UC health campuses, find your cohort, and, and immediately have a cohort that you might be able to do some kinds of research on? That's really the line that we're, we're on right now. Um, link emerging public health surveillance and registry. So Biosense is an example uh, created and managed by the CDC, but it's a one-way thing. We send uh, demographic data essentially to Biosense for syndromic surveillance. Um, uh, you know, is the next uh, uh, SARS out there? Is the next, um, uh, you know, bioterrorism event out there? But we don't get any data back, and so there should be a two-way street. Number nine, add clinical content sophistication and knowledge uh, to mobile and other technologies. Uh, when I look at the phone, uh, the iPhone applications around health, I, I think most of them, frankly, are a joke. But the technology is very powerful. Uh, Eric Topol, one of the physicians who uh, found the Vioxx uh, damage that, that, that was done when he was at uh, Cleveland Clinic, he's done some amazing work with iPhones uh, basically equipped to be um, uh, hemodynamic monitors. And he can basically put on a, a, a strip uh, see, see an iPhone and basically do a heart rhythm strip. Uh, and, and as he says, you know, that kind of eliminates, uh, uh, you know, hundreds of, of millions of dollars of wasted effort that goes into uh, massive cardiology labs and, and testing that frankly take a lot of time and, and, uh, and, and, and cost a lot of money. And then finally, leverage mobile technologies for diagnostic testing. Um, if you look at a lot, of the, you know, the, the worst technology we have and the best technology, you, if you go into like our cardiology labs, we spend tens of millions of dollars on amazing imaging technologies, but they won't let us patch the operating system. And so it's some of the most insecure stuff we have in our hospital. Uh, the FDA uh, forces these vendors to um, test and, and um, certify the, their technology, but it's very expensive. Uh, they, they don't use some modern technologies pretty well, and I'm talking more about the ability to share data and code data, not necessarily the amazing imaging that they can do. So I think those are 10 areas that we could uh, focus on, and, and in some ways uh, we are, but uh, a lot of work yet to be done. Mike, thank you very much. We do have time for some questions. Anybody with questions? Is, is all the data that you have from the campuses? I, I didn't realize that many patients were going through the UC systems. Yeah, the, the estimate now is 11.8 million. And again, that goes back 10 or more years. So it's kind of like a, a total. Uh, we wouldn't see that many on a given year. Other questions? Uh, from the standpoint of the patient, uh, where is your um, involvement with the uh, feedback so that the individual person can take more uh, understanding of what his conditions are, what the possible alternatives might be, and a way of en engaging the patient? Uh, I don't see that. Any best practices you can suggest? Well, 
Well, what we do and, and many uh, hospitals and clinics do now is we have what's called a tethered personal health record. And that, I uh, you know, didn't have time to talk about that, but that's kind of a whole other topic where a patient or a family member, if, if the patient approves it, can log into our EHR and basically get most of the available data on them, but they can see it themselves. They can also copy it in a standard form and take it with them or put it um, into a personal uh, version like Microsoft has something called Health Vault. There's a lot of other data. Um, there, there's a Continual Health Alliance, which is a standards body, and so they're taking digital uh, heart monitors, digital uh, di uh, <laughs> blood sugar devices, and, and many others, and they're uh, allowing the data that you capture on those home digital devices to be sent to an EHR or other things. Um, I think one of the, 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 there's a lot of debate now that if a patient has genetic samples provided, Vanderbilt is building a huge genetic database and patients can opt in or opt out, but if you're admitted to, to, to the hospital at Vanderbilt, they're gonna do a genetic profile on you. And a lot of times, uh, uh, again, the debate is they may find something when they sequence your genome, but they don't, don't always tell the patient. And there's a big controversy now. If we learn something, should we tell the patient? Or in, in some cases, it goes back to how it was consented. But there's a lot of effort now to make consents such that if you take my uh, genetic sample and you do something, some research, and you find that I'm at risk for some disease, you should go, come back and tell me. Um, that is often not done now. So, that, you know, it's a whole, whole other uh, set of discussion, but I think you're, you're very right that it's something that we need to do a lot better on, and, and the patients uh, should, should have much broader access, I think, to not only the clinical uh, data collected on them, but also the research. Question. So it seems that a lot of the technology is in place to share data, and, and the problem is policy. Um, one, one, one particular aspect of that, which you alluded to, was selling information to drug companies, and you said, well, I, I don't like the concept of that. Um, what's to stop institutions, publicly funded institutions, making these large data, data sets publicly available for everybody, um, free of charge? What, what are the issues in getting to that point? I think it boils down to patient consent. I, I think, you know, technically there's no uh, barrier to that. Um, th there is a lot of controversy. Even a week ago there was some articles published where supposedly open genetic databases where the patient had been de-identified but they've contributed their genetic uh, material, uh, people have been able to link them uh, with ancestry databases that you can find on the web and they've been able to re-identify many of the people. And so I think it's kind of sending a shockwave through a lot of people, uh, you know, no, normal people who contribute their samples to this. But I think it's inevitable. I think it's a matter of when, not if, that you're going to have massive databases. I mean, what we're doing at UC, they're going to look back in 10 years and say, wasn't that a quaint example? But we're going to have massive databases of genetic material uh, or genetic um, data linked to high quality phenotype data and then um, a young investigator, uh, wh whoever, will be able to access that uh, for whatever. And uh, I, I, think it's, I think the technology needs a little improvement. I think the phenotype definition needs a lot of improvement. And the policy and the, and the consenting is really probably the, the, the emotional barrier that people have right now. Other questions? Mike, thank you very, very much. Thank you.